Hey there. So my next guest saw a need in the esports market that nobody else was filling, focused on console players. And, you know, he saw everybody focusing on PCs and PC players and all the money and all the leagues focusing on that. But nobody was really looking over to the console people and the console games and the console scene. And he decided to take advantage of it. So this is a really cool one. I know you're all going to love it. everybody. Welcome back to the Gamerpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Bradford Carlton. Today, I have a very special guest with us. I have Ryan Melcinos. Hey there, Ryan. How's it, go? How's it going? Hey, Brad. How are you? It's doing well here. Is the weather hitting you yet? Oh, it's, it's a beautiful sunny day in Las Vegas. How about yourself? Oh. oh, it's a nice snowy day here in Virginia, so not too shabby. Uh, Virginia hasn't gotten too bad. Uh, I mean, it's not like the middle of uh, the country, which is currently iced over. Yeah, I've got I got friends and family down in Texas right now that still don't have power. So uh, hopefully all that comes uh, gets itself fixed here relatively shortly. Sure thing. Uh, which part of Virginia? Uh, Northern Virginia, about 30 minutes west outside of D.C. Oh, OK, so you don't get too bad there. No, we have our times, though. I'm a, I like snow, so I, I wanted more. Didn't get a lot. But what can you do? I understand. I do not like snow. That's why I moved to the desert. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ryan, I like getting the show started just right into it. That's actually way more banter than I would normally do. Can you just begin by just telling us a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, I uh, name's Ryan Melisinos. I'm the co-founder for the Alliance Gaming League, uh, Gamers Combine, and Shock Data. We are involved in the esports industry, but you know, primarily. Uh, focusing on uh, several niches that exist or that we kind of identified. Uh, my background, if anything, been involved in business for well, well over 10 years now. Um, sat as a uh, uh, kind of a right-hand guy to executives for several years and helping small, medium businesses uh, essentially avoid bankruptcy or, or going out of business. Um, I also helped with building sales strategies, marketing strategies, uh, BD rollouts, niche market analysis, a whole lot of different things. But I fell in love with this industry because, hey, I grew up playing games. Why not? Beautiful. All right, Ryan, I start every episode with a single question. So I'm going to ask you just like I ask everybody else on a scale of one to 10, 10 being high, how weird are you? Well, that'd be a question for my wife. Um, I'm probably... <sighs> It depends on the day, man. What a question. Uh, I'd say probably like a seven or eight. I have my moments. And why is that? Why a seven or eight? I think having kids, uh, you know, I have three kids, three kids of my own. They kind of keep me young. Um, even though, you know, I have no hair, that's all gone. Age just, age just blessed me with the bald head. Uh, my, my kids still keep me on my toes and, and being able to, you know, interact with them as a kid again, you know, the imagination that they have um kind of draws out the goofiness in me a majority of the time i love it i'm, I'm right there with you kid at heart right <laughs> Abs absolutely absolutely all right ryan now this is the gamer preneur podcast so i do need your gaming cred before we kind of get into the business stuff when did you first start playing video games whoa uh probably first started playing video games probably when i was around four four or five years old okay. uh going throwing back to the old school atari and i've been through every console ever since uh even I have yet to get the new Xbox or PlayStation. I've been waiting for some of the bugs to get worked out, uh, but I've been, you know, I've been a huge gamer. What started out as a passion has now turned into career. Uh, and I mean, not much else to say, right? In, in this industry, it's whether you're almost everyone's played, you know, played video games. It right. just, uh, it depends on when they started. It's uh, actually really rare to find someone who is not a gamer who has something in the esports space. <laughs> it is. Those are usually the investors, though. <laughs> yeah. All right. And uh, what do you play today, if anything? Do you even have time? Uh, time is limited. I actually had the wonderful opportunity of finishing out Witcher 3 recently. Uh, probably one of my favorite games I've ever played. Um very, very excruciating process and time intensive if anyone's played it. But uh, the, the way it was developed, the immersive experience to it, really, and really enjoyable and definitely a, a, a breath of uh, fresh air away from the typical battle royale scene, um, you know, guns blazing, all that type of thing. So uh, that's that's my last one. Since then, I, 
Not much, man. I understand. I've been trying to play uh, Assassin's Creed Odyssey since November. And I'm not even halfway through. Like, <laughs> I've, I haven't picked up Assassin's Creed since uh, the first, uh, the original release of it. Oh, the original, the original. You got to get at least to the second one. Brotherhood was good. <laughs> Have, haven't haven't played it. I just didn't. I don't think that was not so much time. It was more. I don't know. I, I had interest in in a lot of other things uh, in life at that time, but. For sure. All right. Now you've had almost the full gamut of every game that's come out by your own word. If you had to pick one as your all-time favorite, which game is it? Oh, all-time favorite. Oh, man. Is it... uh, Now it's great. The question now brought a blank spot in my head. Thanks, Brad. Um, (laughs) I... Solid Snake. Um, okay, Metal Gear. Metal Gear Solid. Like, there's there's options here. Yes, yes. All of the above. Okay. All of the above. Um, <laughs> the, the Metal Gear. Uh, yeah, the Metal Gear Solid series. Uh, the original though was my favorite. I played it on the original PlayStation for hours and hours. I actually played through that maybe six or seven times uh, when I was younger. Again, something similar to what Witcher three is, you know, it's more of an immersive experience. Um, strategy is involved and, and I enjoy those types. I love it. All right. Let's get over to the pruner part. That's enough gaming for now. <laughs> uh, Ryan, you kind of gave us a little bit about your professional background, but could you kind of go a little bit more in depth? How did you end up where you're at today? So, uh, you know, funny enough, I was uh, I was the founder of a daily fantasy sports company several years back, and, and me and my business partners at the time were, you know, taking a look at all the uh, all the industries kind of making their way into DFS, and we saw esports was getting there. So those that are on DraftKings, FanDuel, you know, any of the likes, you know, they're they're able to make wagers and and bet on you know the League of, League of Legends and uh, you know Call of Duty series. It, it just it's becoming more mainstream to bet on esports. And when I saw that, I was like, "That's interesting. You know, this is really intriguing." So we took you know me and my business partners you know wanted to really you know take a deep dive into that side of the industry and see what was available there. And at first we were like, how do we, you know, how do we spin something up with our, you know, with our company in esports, you know, focused on betting. And the more we got into it, the more we started really seeing that there's a lot more opportunity that meets the eye. And it's, it's all about just identifying it and finding it. Everyone right now is trying to rush into this industry, trying to, you know, be the, the next best thing. But there's a lot of things that still haven't been uncovered or still haven't been addressed yet. And, and that's where we kind of came in and the reason why we, we came in. Okay. So what was it that you uncovered then? Where, where is your focus? So our focus with, with the Alliance Gaming League itself was to address the console uh, I would say the console movement um, as back in 2012 when PC really kind of kicked up and then PC stood as king and esports really started to take off and you get a lot of the big name brands out there phased, you know, 100 Thieves, Misfits, all these guys. Console more and more each year got put to the back burner and kind of became irrelevant in any term of a conversation with competitive gaming. In my mind and in the mind of many others here, Console players deserve their stage as well. And that's where the AGO really came into this industry was to provide that stage for console players to really show their talents, really identify there is potential for a career path in here as long as someone creates it and builds it for them. It really wasn't there yet. And that's what we've been doing ever since. Recently, we, you know, we kind of, well, I'd say kind of, we merged the whole crossplay, you know, mentality now with a lot of games coming out to it, and, cr- and structured our league now to fit that. So our league now is comprised of uh, organizations, smaller gaming organizations that have the the structure, the 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 business mindset to want to become the next phase. But you know how. It's very difficult, Brad, to get to that level, as I'm sure you know. And they are now exclusively competing in the AGL and working with us to provide a 
a, a more identifiable roadmap for them and also encompassing cross play as the build for these teams. So it's no longer just a PC team going against a PC team. It's PC console going against PC console. As I firmly believe esports will turn out to be. It won't be two seg- you know, segregated segments. They'll be merged together eventually when people start to realize that you're just you know, you're, you're putting a knife in between, you know, two different sides where potential exists. Okay. Now I know you and I had talked about this well before we ever got onto this episode, but I want to make sure I address this here. Aren't console players at a disadvantage against their, their PC opponents? Yes. Older consoles. Absolutely. Um, the thing is, is everyone goes, Oh, it's M and K or, you know, or controller. Well, there's a lot of controller PC players too. The thing is, it's not so much your, if your mouse is on your right hand, right? That is the, that's the advantage to the PC, your mouse, not the keys themselves uh, on your keyboard, just the mouse. Cause you're able to, you know, do any type of movement much quicker than you would on a thumbstick. But the thing is, is we kind of, we kind of sold console players short and people should start witnessing it or start becoming more aware to it. If you take a look at console players now, or even controller players on PC, you'll start to see the more you pay attention to it, these guys can react somewhat similar to those on PC. The thing is, is we just weren't giving them really the time of day because we, as I stated before, we drove this wedge into console and PC. You know, the the thing is PC took off. Let's all remember PC took off because endemic and non-endemic brands got involved because PC was a higher revenue driver. It's built of several components, several different areas. In console, there's not much to really get involved in. You know, this, the industry was taken off by the, the PC component players, the PC build players, you know, all that. But with console, it's, yeah, PlayStation or Xbox. And, and I'm not gonna even go into Wii U and, and, and all those, but, you know, PlayStation or Xbox and what you can really get involved with as a, as a brand is only offering, you know, headsets or controllers or skins, or, you know, those type of things. So the market was much better for PC and eventually, it just was built out that way where, well, PC is king and, and that's that's who deserves the limelight here. Again, I, I beg to differ. Okay. Now, uh, thank you for that answer, Ryan. I'd, I'd actually like to pull back. I want to talk more about you because uh, my show is not necessarily about the businesses themselves. It's not about the, the business of gaming. It's about gamers and business. So I want to really gotcha. I want to focus in on you here. What is your role at AGL? Uh, so I am the CEO and co-founder. Uh, I essentially look over everything. Uh, but primarily, you know, I'm a very hands-on individual when it comes to any project that I'm I'm involved in. Uh, that's everything from the sales side to you know uh, uh, partner, you know, discovery and discussions and closing, to identifying the 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 right people internally, even those that are down to just you know the gamers themselves, the players themselves, talking to them, being involved with the communities on Discord and social. Uh, literally, if any, and I'm sure you've probably said it before, when you step into any role like this anyway, you've got to wear every single hat in that company. Um, and I, I try to wear them proudly. Sometimes I'll have too many hats on and then it gets a little overwhelming, but uh, I'm, in, I'm involved in every facet. Okay. And was it difficult for you to, to fill this position? I know you said you, you've worked with other entrepreneurs, other owners of companies. Was this something that you had to learn and grow into, or is this something you just kind of did naturally? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Um, I, I think the natural, the natural part is actually the drive to want to do something. Uh, the, my own persistence to want to create an opportunity here, not just for myself, but more so, more so for others. Um, identifying and learning the industry, well, that took time. That took me actually wanting to dive in and, you know, open discussions with some key influencers, open discussions with, you know, other, you know, executives in larger companies like, you know, EA or Activision or, you know, finding out what they're doing. What are they seeing in terms of this landscape? Hell, you know, going with, you know, HyperX, SteelSeries, finding out why they're involved. You know, a lot of these pieces all kind of, you know, put together this giant puzzle. So I spent a lot of time trying to piece it all together, which is you know where we are today. Okay. What makes you good at it? 
I mean, there's there's plenty of people trying to start organizations in esports and businesses in esports, but not, not a lot of them are doing all that well. How how are you special? What are what makes you unique? What's your skill set, talent set? I, I wouldn't say I, I wouldn't say I'm special or unique. Uh, I would put more so. I guess I'll take a step back here and kind of shed my own light on this, if I will, Brad. Uh, the biggest enemy to any entrepreneur is themselves. And what I mean by that is no one should be going and trying to start an organization or a company thinking it's going to be a very easy road to travel. You are going to be sorely mistaken. The thing is, there is going to be hiccups. There's going to be hurdles, but you have to be able to drive yourself to go over them, to circumvent them, to continue on the path you want to create. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm no more special than anyone to the left or right of me. The difference is, is my mentality is to continuously keep going forward. Um, there will be setbacks, but you can't lose sight of the, the overall end goal, the overall benchmarks you put in place. Uh, it's essentially, that's, that's my honest answer to it. Beautiful. All right. Now, is this what you're meant to do or, or where were you looking to grow into? Uh, do you mind kind of clarifying that question? I don't want to take it the wrong way. Sure. So is is this it? Have you found your life's calling here at AGL? Or are you looking to, to take this, this business somewhere larger? Uh, th- th- there's always a bigger picture. Um, I think one of the things that, that I kind of, I would say I pat myself on the back for is any opportunity that I that I'm presented with or that I'm I'm getting involved with, uh, I take a look at more than what's being presented. What are the opportunities ahead of it? How can I take what is here and grow it into something much larger that we can't even identify with now? Uh, it's the thought of don't put your you know all your eggs in one basket, right? A single point of failure in a business. So if you're within any industry, even if it's in the esports industry, you know, I always constantly look at, all right, if I see that there's this, this, and this here that we can be a part of, let's slowly start you know, trying to get be a part of it. We'll put more effort into what kind of grabs quicker or what has a faster traction, but never let go of anything else. Because what you'll end up finding out is you'll be essentially a tree with all these different limbs out there touching all these different parts. And you never know what that new part you're touching provides you as a company or you as an individual to do something just as unique or even better or provide another opportunity as a whole for everyone involved. All right. I love that answer. Um, what advice do you have for someone who may be sitting there watching this episode with you who might want to be starting their own league of some type, but they're not quite sure where to start? You know, one of the best advice I gave someone recently, actually, is there is a lot of organizations out there or a lot of people with you know aspirations out there to get involved in this industry, be the next, as say, you know, phase or 100 thieves or even a technology company, right? But they're seeing what they're seeing is what's already been done. While there's room for those to emulate what's already been created or already been successful, like those like phase and, and, and others there, my advice is don't go in with that mindset of trying to be them. I would say go in to be you. Any industry has openings for innovation. Any industry has openings for every individual where they don't have to mirror someone else's success. Create your own. Create your own part within this industry. Everyone says, oh, that pie is all filled already. I'm going to try to carve out my piece. No. Create your own pie. It just serves a piece into that industry. All right. Beautiful. Now, um, how long have you been with AGL or how long since you started it? Been about two and a half years now. Okay. If you go back two and a half years in time and you could meet little Ryan back then. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And you could tell him all the ups, all the downs, all the challenges, all the good and the bad, and kind of give him the advice he needs to know in order to make this bigger, badder, faster, more profitable, whatever. But there was one thing he absolutely had to know. What would you tell him? Um, Trust your instincts. 
uh, simplest form. And I would say at any point, and this is in any, any industry, this is also not my first venture. So I've had some experience when it comes to, you know, hurdles or obstacles. Um, there'll be moments you'll question yourself, but at the end of the day, you got to trust your instincts that what you're doing is right and block out all the extra noise. Okay. Wonderful. Um, I'd like to kind of go down that route a little bit more that you were just making there. Um, you see, Ryan, I actually believe that we learn the most in our life from our failures, not necessarily our successes. Mm -hmm. Because when you succeed, you may not know what happened. You're like, ah, I won. But when you fail, you got to take a look at it. You got to be able to move past it in order to move forward and succeed maybe the next time or however many times thereafter it takes, right? So I'd like to ask you, what do you consider your biggest failure in life? And what did you learn from it? Whoa. All right. What a question there. Thanks, Brad. Curveball. Um, it's not like it's on the question set I sent you. <laughs> uh, biggest, biggest failure in life. You know, it, it probably, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, Brad. Uh, honestly, um, there's been a lot, there's been a lot of failures and you know, I'm, I had the same mindset you do. Uh, I always learn from the failures and I don't think anyone can grow unless they fail. So they identify what it feels like to fail and how you avoid going back to it. It, it might be. Goodness, man, this is like the hardest question ever. Way to, way to stump me, Brad. Um, That's all good. I'm like, uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to pull out like, okay, well, was it, you know, uh, me not, you know, not fully finishing college? Was it, you know, me not leaving my, you know, uh, not uh, taking an opportunity out in California that was there? Yeah, I guess if I can answer the question without being so direct in the response, um, there's been a lot of, a lot of instances in my life where I would consider a failure, uh, both personal and professional. Okay. That's... But I think, I think both of them make up who I am, who I am today, just as long as I learned from it. I absolutely, I'm right there with you. I've, I've had businesses, I've lost over a hundred thousand dollars in like just a couple, like I, I get it. <laughs> um, on the flip side, what is something you're working to improve on yourself today? Uh, what I'm working to improve on myself today is actually something on a more personal note. Uh, make sure to always put aside time for family. Um, I get so, you know, uh, so involved in work that sometimes I don't, uh, I never, re you know, I didn't realize for, for a while that I was affecting, you know, my, my loved ones, my kids and my wife, because I'd be sitting in my office, you know, constantly on calls. You know, if I'm, if I'm talking to people overseas, I'm on the phone at, you know, one, two o'clock in the morning. And so this, you know, this past, I'd say six, seven months, actually, I made sure to uh, dedicate time every single day for just family. No outside noise, no phone, no computer. Uh, and it, to be honest, it's, it's been a blessing. It's kept me sane. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Now, uh, this is a question I like asking people in the sports space, just because it's it's one of those typical interview questions, and it's just kind of fun. Where do you see esports in five years? Ooh, um, I see esports in five years, kind of encompassing a lot of different things that are currently exploding, even in today's headlines. Take a look at crypto, cryptocurrency. Right. There are several gaming cryptos that are out there right now that aren't being utilized in the best possible way to really drive a focus or I would say an acceptance within this industry yet. Um, I think that's going to be a huge staple in the future, a huge uh, uh, influence on uh, transactional currency within this industry. Uh, in addition to that, I think what we see in terms of league structures, in terms of uh, professional outfits uh, within this industry are going to dramatically change. Uh, there are, you know, you take a look at, uh, you know, organizations out there that were originally leagues or competitive teams are now lifestyle brands, right? Mm -hmm. That was a adaptation to this market. Uh, and as we continue on, we're going to continue, you know, we're going to 
constantly adapt to the growing technology, but the growing need of uh, the growing need of those outside that want the content or want to be involved. And and where what I kind of mean by that is you look at other professional uh, professional leagues out there, the NFL, the NBA, the NHL. Uh, it's a huge fall, you know, it's a, they're huge brands and they have a bunch of, you know, patrons that attend games or, or follow them. I'm a diehard, as you can see, you know, Washington football team uh, fan and, you know, esports is becoming that as they start to identify why, you know, why having a higher churn rate in, in terms of game content is more key than more just re- regurgitation of the same thing, it, you know, it's, it's creating this entirely new scope for the esports industry, but then you're going to get more brands involved. You're going to get more technology involved that you wouldn't even think of really is a thing now. Hell, I personally believe there's going to be, um, you know, uh, the drone flying, the, the pro uh, drone flying is going to become an actual esport, uh, And, I, I think it's possible. I mean, you look at Mario Kart, right? Uh, Mario Kart right now, where it's now this virtual world you created inside your own home, a uh, virtual track you created inside your own home with just a card with that camera on it, and then your Switch. So that kind of gives you a glimpse into what the future can hold as we adopt those things, like you know, more VR and then you know AR. It really depends. All right, that's a wonderful answer. Now I got uh, one more question and then we'll start bringing this in for a landing, all right? Sounds good. What do you, or what did you or have you thought is the biggest challenge in growing and building AGL as well as the greatest joy you've had? Gotcha. Um, the The biggest challenge I think in any, uh, in any organization you're creating is to, and kind of going back to it, uh, uh, keep pushing forward. Um, there's going to, you know, there's been several instances where there seemed to be more of a stagnant activity rather than progression. And while you can sit there and say, you know, am I doing something wrong? No, not necessarily. You just might need to keep doing it for longer till people start to realize what it is you're doing. Uh, and that's kind of how everything kind of ties into you asked what was the biggest success, right? Well, we had, I have hate mail, by the way, from the people in this industry sending, you know, saying stuff to me saying, you know, you guys will fail within six months. You know, you guys, you know, don't belong in this industry. Why are you focused on console? And it's not shocking. Those that are, that know about this industry know how toxic it is. And that's also something I wish we could change entirely with this industry. But I want to say thank you to those people that did send those those messages, by the way, because it became fuel to have me push even harder and do more amazing stuff. Because at the end of it, the stagnant activity that was occurring here was actually just a boilerplate for what was going to explode in terms of an attraction and explode in terms of recognition within our side of this industry. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Ryan, this has been a fantastic interview. Thank you again. How do people find you? Where are you out on social media, contact information, all that, please? Yeah. So people, if they want to follow the Alliance Gaming League and see what we're getting into, we've got some really cool things coming out this year that are even outside of the AGL's platform, standard platform, by the way. I think everyone's going to be really intrigued with that. Uh, you can go on Instagram or uh, Instagram at Alliance Gaming League, Twitter at Alliance G League. Uh, you can find me, Ryan Melisinos, on LinkedIn. And if you want to shoot me a connection or open up a chat, would love to uh, love to talk. That's that's it. I, you ain't getting my personal phone number. You're not getting my. <laughs> I'm joking. All, right. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Now, uh, as we wrap this up, do you have any final thoughts you want to share or anything I didn't ask you think we still need to cover? Brad, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I'm really impressed with what you've been able to contribute here within this industry. Having someone with a centered focus as you, some past experience really does provide some value uh, for those out there that have kind of lost in their way of how they get involved. Uh, if there's one thing I, I will add to, you know, add to this 
as kind of a mental note for those that might be viewing or watching. Um, getting involved into this industry, there's a lot of opportunity, a lot. And I'm sure people tell you that all the time. The thing, the thing is, though, is there's very little innovation. And while you can sit there and possibly scratch your head and go, what do you mean little innovation? Games have a tremendous amount of innovation. But in the esports industry itself, you get tournaments, you can see stuff on, you know, on Twitch or on stream. You can, uh, uh, you know, go to a brick and mortar, you know, game center. It, it, there's a lot. But the one thing that really lacks or what really needs to be picked up on is innovation, providing new ways for people to interact within this industry, uh, providing, you know, new ways for organizations outside of yours to get involved in this industry or opening up an entire, as I say, the Pandora's box of what this industry can provide. Uh, the thing is, a lot of this hasn't been created yet, and it's waiting for those just like you, Brad, or, or me, or those that are tuning in to create it. That's why the AGL exists, right? It wasn't there. I decided, well, hell, I'm going to create it. Okay. And we and here we are today. Wonderful. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on today. I genuinely do appreciate it. Brad, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I would love, love, love to do it again in the future if you ever will have me. For sure. And for everybody else, I'm going to remind you all, don't be just a gamer, be a gamerpreneur. <laughs>